Hi, I'm Mallory Whitfield, and today I'm going to be talking with my dear friend Sandy from Tribes of Togetherness about how to cope with loneliness. Sandy has experienced a lot of tragic events and loss of family members and has learned how to cope with loneliness from a very firsthand experience. Um, and so she has a lot of experience with that firsthand and now she also works with people from all sorts of backgrounds to help them learn how to cope with loneliness and to help them learn some of the emotional intelligence tools that she uses and that they can use to to deal with tough emotional things like loneliness and grief sandy and i are both all about bringing people together and we bonded together during some long car rides back to new york city coming back from the program where we met which was a training program for public speakers um, just a heads up in this interview we will be discussing some fairly you know tough topics things like death and some thoughts of suicide but sandy hopefully uh, will give you the tools to cope with loneliness during this tough time uh, that we are all dealing with this global pandemic. So let's dive right in. So you have a lot of experience learning how to deal with loneliness. And I know that your own experience predates this time of the COVID pandemic, right? So a lot of people have been suddenly dealing with a lot of additional loneliness in the last few months, but you were kind of forced to, to learn how to deal with loneliness in your own way before that. Can you share your own experience in learning how to deal with loneliness and some of what you've gone through? I certainly may. <laughs> I'm very excited to be here with you. So good to see you. I missed you, my love. Thank you, you for inviting me um, to your show. It's just so beautiful and relaxing <laughs> for a moment. Um, loneliness, yes. I have some, some interesting stories to talk about and I just wanna put it out there for those who are having some issues with grief, this is going to be a little bit mindful, so, but I just wanna let everybody know that I am safe and I am good and um, I've been through some traumatic losses, um, with people passing on due to health concerns and people who have walked away during my winter storms, let's say. Um, um, in 2013, um, you know, I had, you know, I had the, uh, you know, my mother went ahead and um, was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and, and when she got diagnosed in November 5th, um, December 5th, um, she only lived for one month for stage four pancreatic cancer and she passed on, um, which was really um, hurtful because I've been, this is my mom, this is my best mom, and I know you see a picture behind. <laughs> so um, she has been my rock and we've been hanging out. That was my best buddy in the world too. I mean, sometimes people always talk about mothers, and that's what the best friends, but as soon as we got older, we, we knew what we were about. and. Um, and she was great. That was my best buddy. She always was always always wondering, have you ever had those moms that told you about, oh no, here we go. <laughs> They're gonna call again, wonder where you are, where you at, where is what's going on, what's happening? You know, that's that was my mom and I, I kind of miss her. So um, where are we? 2020, yeah. So it's been about now about yeah, six years without her. And then after my mom passed on, I had an older sister. Um, and 11 months later, after my mom's death, um, she um, was diagnosed with um, breast cancer, but she had that for, for a few, for a while, but um, she was in remission, but um, then it came back and there was no way to save my sister. So she passed on in November, 2014. So that left me and my dad. So me and my dad were going to be survivors of this and, and, and continue on the strength of losing two people, two women in, in, our, in our life. He lost his wife and he lost his daughter and me, mom, and my sister. However, three months later, my dad, unfortunately, well, my dad had a misfortunate um, stroke and he died of a heart attack three months later after my sister's death. So in a whole, so that's 2015. So in a whole, let's say, 14 months, 
I went through heavy losses and it's not fun. That, those, those, and I try to look up on the internet, has anyone lost their family members in a short span of two and a half years, you know? And of course you can't find it. And I had to figure out on my own, how was I going to deal with this heavy loss? Because that was my unit, that was it. Three of us were a unit. I mean, we had other family members, but we were more into um, togetherness with each other and everything. So for the be the last surviving family, 2015, my whole world fell apart because that's when I looked around and said, I was alone, going home alone after, you know, my dad died at the hospital. Yeah. And what, how did you get through that time? Because that's a lot to lose basically your entire family in a really short amount of time. You know, they just keep one after another. So like, how did you get through that time? Um, well, the beginning was hard, you know, and I'd rather be honest here in this call <laughs> and, this, and say that um, the beginning is hard because you have all thoughts of suicide. You have all thoughts of drugs. You always have that, that the devil coming at you with drugs, alcohol, or suicide, or overeating. Everything else was just bothering me for the last two years. 2015, 16 was the hardest for me. I even, you know, when, when my father's attorney reached out to me, wanted to know what's going on with you and everything, I was flying, I kept going away to who I thought was my family members that cared about me, but I kept flying out down south thinking that they cared and wanted to make sure I was okay. When in reality, they were just looking for something else, I, you know whether they're looking to, they weren't looking for my well-being. Let's put it that way. You know, I don't think they cared about what I was. They cared about what was left or something. Who knows? But in the end, um, I had the audacity to, you know, after my attorney did find out what was going on and everything, I had, the, I, you know, I was blessed to have a home that was all paid for. I didn't have to pay rent or anything. I had a home, the mortgage was all paid off, the lawyer was telling me everything was fine. I just had to figure out what to do and the lawyer just locked up the funds that was left for me to do. I mean, I had my own money and I don't care. I was like, okay, I don't care, I'm gonna still drink my, drink my misery away or do something because I asked him, okay, so why don't I just plan out my funeral because there's no one that's gonna be there for me. So I figured 2016, since everyone died 13, 14, 15, 16, why don't I just put out the message out there and just say, okay, I'm gonna just put out that I'm gonna bury me, but just cremate me, that's it. And he looked at me like, are you kidding me? What is wrong with you? I don't think you're, and then he's like, I don't think you're going. I think that's it. I think you're stuck here, but he told me that you have a lot of work to do and I suggest that you go home and figure out what is what is gonna be beneficial for you because I'm not unlocking anything for you at this moment because your dad and your parents and your sister work too hard for you to go ahead and waste it away on stupid shit. So I had a lot of work to do and what saved me was my sister who I did not get along with and she actually had, you know, I was able to find books on personal development. And I didn't know what personal development was. I said, wow, my sister had all these books. And I guess those books were helping her to save her um, through her cancer treatments or for her, you know, going through her battle and everything, even though she had her mom and dad and me to support. But she never got along with me. She never had a connection with me. but. But then I found all her diaries, her journals. And you would think that's private. I couldn't, I couldn't help myself. I had to open it and know what, why was there so much animosity towards me? But first, let me get into what happened is that I had to be in solitude. I had to, in the words of Brene Brown, I had to brave the wilderness. <laughs> I had to be in solitude for a moment to really figure out what am I going to do without the family members that I had for the last 40 years of my life. 
and it took a lot of work. I mean, it took, a, it took reading personal self-development book and me heading to see Tony Robbins because my sister had all of Tony Robbins stuff. I was like, wow, my sister had all of this stuff about values, boundaries, loving yourself, um, having acceptance in the world and everything. And I, I was like, wow, my sister had all of this but did she use this? Like, did she gain anything from it? Because she had so much animosity towards me mostly, but other people when I read her stuff. But, but I found that the personal development book really gave me a chance to understand where I stand. And it was a challenge <laughs> because I had to do it by myself or a therapist, but I didn't hire, I, I had a therapist already, but sometimes, he didn't, he's like confused and everything else. And he's like, um, what's going on? What's happening? And um, he, he's trying to help as much because he knows I've been grieving for my mom for longer. So for him to know what's going on, I just stayed with him or anything. So, but most of the time when I did personal development, I just worked on being in solitude. I had to be in solitude in the wilderness to figure out what my life, why do I, why should I stay here? Yeah. Yeah. And dealing with loneliness and grief and the death of loved ones, it's something that is really hard and it's not a fast process, I think, for anybody, right, <laughs> to deal with. And, and I think probably most or if not all of us wish it was a fast process, like wish we could just, you know, wave a magic wand and feel better. But yeah, I think we have to kind of sit with that solitude and kind of just learn how to accept it, right? And I know that you kind of going through that, um, now you work with other people who are dealing with loneliness and dealing with other mental health things. So can you talk about that and the work that you do now and kind of how you got to that point of being inspired to do that work to help others, having gone through what you did? Oh, sure. Um, what happened is, is that it took, I had to take care of me first though. You know, in order for me to help, I wouldn't be able to help anybody because I was craving for attention. I was looking to belong and looking to be part of the in crowd or anything like that. And but by doing the personal development really gave me that help to really acknowledge and know what really matters to me the most so that I can support others. So I am part of NAMI, which is National Alliance Mental illness uh, network. Um, I am an ambassador. I am an advocate for um, all others that are going through their emotional pain, their loneliness. Plus, now after this pandemic, it gave me a lesson for me to go give it back to. So for me, I was I was able to learn because I know what it feels like to be alone when uncertainty happens, when a risk happens or anything like that. Because who knew that I lose all my family and I had to stick alone and not knowing what to do and whatnot. But I had the tools and the tips and the education to go back and give back because NAMI was an organization that I attended to because when you go to grief counseling, it's only for 12 weeks. And I couldn't find any places where I could do grief or anything else. So I just started going to NAMI just to talk about where I was feeling because not only it was grief, but there's social anxiety there's loneliness and it was for me it, it had everything that i needed about spiritual um writing journaling because i got into journaling so much i journal every day now like that's my love i even got into morning pages 750 words a day um but i the that working with the people now is really showing up what how much have I accomplished to help these people? Because now, in order for me to help, I had to go through the pain and suffering so that I can be empathetic with those who are going through their pain and suffering. And it's been a delight. I've been working with, with so many different people that are doing, that want to do the inner work, that want to make the necessary changes in their life to live a purposeful life. So that's how I started. I know it was long winded. Sorry. <laughs> well, yeah. And so you mentioned journaling, right? And I know on your blog, you've recently been doing a series of kind of tips and, and resources for people who are dealing with loneliness, especially during this COVID pandemic. 
And I saw that journaling was one of them. And you had also mentioned something called quarantine chat, which I had never heard of. So can you share more about some like specific resources that people could use or take advantage of to deal with loneliness? Oh my God, thanks for reading that. Yeah, because I've been putting, I think a, a lot of people need some help on how to overcome this lockdown loneliness or social isolation because I'm doing a five week series. I did part four already yesterday and everything put it out there for people to stop blaming others. I love that. That was something I would want to talk about because we always put blame on others when we should take responsibility for our own actions and try and, and work on ourselves instead. But yeah, what got me into doing that is because I wanted to write that five week series just to help people to um, find a way, especially quarantine chat. When I saw that, I was like, oh, what's this about? Because they can have, even, they'd be strangers, because nowadays, when you go outside, it's hard to have that communication with someone outside now, because you have the mask on, and you don't know if they're smiling or not. But when you go on quarantine chat or anything like that, you, they give you a phone number, you can have that conversation with them if you want. If you don't, that's fine. You go to the next one. It's almost like a dating app, but still, it's someone that you can have a social connection with. It's different. It's, it was in a business insider, and I, I, I got involved with it. I was like, oh, let me see what this is about. I mean, it, it's, it's helpful because it's like, oh, are you speaking to strength? Because that's, that's what I was doing before this quarantine happened. I would just make friends with strangers, even in the elevator here in New York City. And people would be like, shocked. Because you know how New York City, <laughs> New Yorkers are, they're like, you talking to me? <laughs> I was like, yes, yes, I'm talking to you. And I was able to do that. And then when this happened, people are scared. They don't know. So I figured this quarantine chat was helpful for others to use and take advantage of that if you want to make phone calls. Because sometimes nowadays, people are not able to have that conversation with friends that they thought they were friends. Because I know how that feels when you know, because when I went through my storms, the people I knew didn't didn't know how to handle the situation. It was it was too weak. I understand we're all in the weakness moment, but what am I supposed to do? I have to move forward and live my life with purpose. But find strangers because you never know; they could be your lifelong friend that you'll meet and have fun with. So. Yeah. Well, okay. And so this idea of like talking to making friends with strangers, whether through an app like quarantine chat or chatting up people in the elevator or at the Starbucks or wherever. Um, do you think that loneliness affects introverts and extroverts differently? Right? Like, I feel like we've talked a lot in the last few years about like introverts and, and extroverts and ambiverts, which is kind of a blend of the two, which is kind of what I identify as lately. Like, I feel like I switch back and forth, but do you think, um, like, are, is it easier for introverts to deal with loneliness because they're used to being alone? Or is that like, some, yeah, like a bias I, that we have? Or? No, I noticed that some introverts are liking this. They're like, you see, guys, that's what I told you. This is what you get. <laughs> they be saying that to me. I'm like, I tell them that I was an extrovert, but they're like, but you act like you are so extrovert but I said no I do need my alone time sorry at the end of the day I do have some introvertness but I go out there just to have that conversation and feel like I done something I went and made human connection because we're all social creatures don't tell me that you like to be in solitude that's fine I'm not mad at that but I think people are people are like ah, they're laughing at us actually they are they're laughing at the extrovert people. See, that's what you get. See, and and they feel like eh, with the introverts, they want connections, but they just they just want it to be meaningful. It, it, they don't want it to be fake or hogwash, especially with the social media world, where you, people are so looking for acceptance in that world and all the likes and everything. They just want that human connection with someone that's open honest and emotionally vulnerable they don't want that you know fakeness and i i thank them for telling me that they feel like i'm an extrovert but i said no i'm an introvert in moments you know yeah yeah I, one another thing i know that um you've talked about is using like physical activity, right? Like I know you live in New York City and I know here too, like I, one of the ways that I started dealing with loneliness pre-COVID, I went through a big breakup and live transition and went to living on my own after being with a partner for many years and kind of also had to prep the how to deal with loneliness <laughs> ahead of this moment in time. 
And one of the things that helped me was physical exercise and walking and getting out in the park. Um, so can you talk about like kind of the connection between the physical body and sort of the mental aspect of loneliness and, and how, how that works, how that can help us? Before pre-COVID, I was a five o'clock a.m. girl going to the gym because the gym is right downstairs on my building. So I loved it. And then when COVID happened, I was like, where am I going to go to the gym now? So of course, we got to get creative. And this is what you got to do. You got to get creative when this COVID happened. But activity, physical activities does help overcome that you ever feel alone, even though it's an hour, 45 minutes. Me as a 5 a.m. girl that loves to work out, but I don't do it anymore at 5 because of this COVID. I work from home and, and I'm like, I go at 6.30 when the light is out. But for me, exercising is inspiring me to have a positive mental attitude throughout the day, set my intentions for the day, to live a positive, like doing this today. I was like, oh, today, because I look at my calendar, oh, I have to see Mallory today, you know, like, I was like, oh, good, I get to see Mallory, have that uplifting um, conversation with you, be, let it be very smooth and nothing crazy or anything. Then I had another call this morning, too, and then I have another call after. Um, but if you do the workout, you're gonna feel so much better throughout the day. Your whole physical mind and body is going to set your intention to have an uplifting mood. It's a good mood. I mean, I mean, people say sex. I understand people talk about sex. It's like, wow, sex is good too. But, but no. I mean, when you're in this moment and and you don't have the connection, because people would ask me about dating and everything, and I was like, <laughs> I'm not there for the dating part. But um, physical activity really uplifts your, your brain power to, to have that positive, upbeat attitude for yourself. Yeah. Well, and you've shared so many good resources here. And I know that you share great resources on, on your blog and social media. And you've been doing some like webinars and other things too lately, right? Can you share more about like if people wanted your help, you know, or your resources in dealing with loneliness, like what you have available? Sure. <laughs> I have, well, I actually um, partner up with this company, which is called Life and Balanced Careers, which um, reached out to me and wanted to connect with me to bring out a program, um, which just talks about healthy mind. And I, I went and re researched it first. So I wanted to see if this is a good fit for me. Does this something I do? Because I am part of the mental health work. That's my that's what I love to do is to get people's mind into getting into a healthy mind state instead of having the negative state because we're all in the past. We get stuck in the past that we should be in living in the present moment and looking at ahead for the future. So I decided to um, do this program to help others overcome their emotional the emotional uh, distress that they have been coming along during this challenging times. And what I do is I, I give a webinar just to bring value to them, see what they want and, and see where they're at. And I've been submitting this out to people on my list to get their feel for it. And I have people that are liking it. They're enjoying it. They're like, wow, what is this about? And I do this webinar twice a month. Um, and I will send you the link, of course, to show you. And I actually, once I'm done with the webinar, I ask them for their clients if they want to turn into clients, which is a 12-week program. It's a 12 weeks program. And afterwards, you want anything more, we'll talk about later. But this is what I'm talking about, too, because it's my heart right now. So I just help you um, how to have the how to acknowledge your emotion for the rest of your life instead of holding on to the past. Like really look into the present instead of it, you know, like I talk about how, the, how, the, how to have the best year of your life, but how about having the best emotional stress for the rest of your life instead of holding on to the past or anything. And it, it will probably take 12 weeks for you to get through. And I know sometimes people will say, no, it doesn't, but with the emotional awareness, it will pick up. It will, you know, especially with people who are dealing with grief, because grief could be about divorce too. Grief could be about loss of friendship, breakup of friendships, or breakup with boyfriend or girlfriend. I get it. But 
this really opens my mind to help them expand their mind to living, you know, being emotionally vulnerable. And, and I'm a Brene Brown fan. I, I, I feel like people are like, oh my God, but she talks so much stuff that really needs to be out there more. It's about belongings, it's about communities, about trust. And I'm a fan of her or anything um, because I just, it helped me to release all that emotional distress that I could pour out because people, it's amazing, Mallory, right? That people <laughs> like, like to hear these type of stories. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think it's so great that you're providing these resources to help people change their lives. Um, and I know you mentioned Brene Brown, who is also a favorite of mine. Um, but maybe, maybe one other, so what is one other resource could be another person or a book or something that really changed your life for the better? Wow. I know, right? <laughs> Cause I read so much, I've been reading so much books. Um, ever since I found those first, cause I read, I read from Stephen Covey, from, um, Tony Robbins and, oh God, what is this guy? Jack Canfield, like all these books and people are saying, yeah, white men. I was like, yeah, I know, but my sister had the book, but I think I found Les Brown. <laughs> wait, wait, so can you, can you share Les Brown? I do know Les Brown stuff, but like, can you share who, so can you explain Les Brown and what? what he talks about, what his impact was for you? Well, Les Brown is another personal development teacher, a, a black man that doesn't, I, I feel like he does get recognition, but it seems like all the stuff that I see is like mostly white men. And it's like, wait a minute, there's some black people in here. <laughs> Let's see what they're about. And Les Brown talks about the personal development side of it. And, he, and even Tony Robbins talks about him. He's all about, you know, cherishing the, the protocol of living a life that with purpose, with meaning, and, and living your life that, that way. So when I found out about Les, I said, you know, I'm here reading all these men. And I'll never forget when one lady asked me, oh, yeah, all white men. <laughs> I was like, okay, you're right. <laughs> but you learn, but you turn it down and you, you turn it around and make it, make it your own. You know, just like I say Renee Brown, I should say Maya Angelou, right? Don't get me wrong, Maya Angelou is great too. But at the time, these were all the messages that I was getting and was helping me to understand about true belonging being a community, being able to exist. So, so for me, I mean, cause now we're in a racial trauma too. I don't know if you want to talk about that too, but we're, I, we're in a, and I, I, I have a feeling that we're all going to be more open to have these difficult conversations now. Yeah. Well, and I think to your point about so many of um, these popular speakers, these popular like motivational professional develop or, you know, personal growth people for so long that has been dominated by a lot of white men. But I feel like now more people are trying to seek out diverse voices, right? Like not just wanting somebody to look like you, but wanting people of all different backgrounds, because I think it's really helpful because somebody of a, somebody who looks different might actually have a more similar way of, you know, coping with the world and dealing with our emotions, right? Like we all handle our emotions differently. Like we all have different ways that we think and learn. And I think that everybody can be a teacher in some way. So I think it's important to have that diverse set of influences, right? No, no. And I agree. I, I feel like it has to be diversified. I mean, with me, I just learn from them because I feel like they taught me well where I'm going to turn it around and make it look like, hey, this this is what's going on. All right, here I am. Here's your, because all we know for personal development is Lisa Nichols or Ileana Van Zandt in the personal development space. But I'm more towards Lisa Nichols a little bit. I like her. I follow, I follow her mostly because she talks about what I'm into, like Mind Valley, mind and your emotions and, and togetherness and everything. So, um, but we need more of us to go on that stage. And that's what I'm working on. And I'm putting myself out there more. I'm actually doing something at the UK. I don't know if I told you, but I 
I, um, I've been accepted to do a virtual summit for ending the campaign of loneliness because at the UK, they do a lot of loneliness um, projects out there. And I'm super excited, it's in September. And I'll let you know more further about that and send you the link to that. That's so exciting, congrats. <laughs> yeah, I got my speaking gig, I was like, ah! Yay! So Sandy, um, what advice would you give to your 20 year old self? <laughs> if you could go back in time, you know, like knowing everything that you've experienced in your life, what would you tell your younger self? I would say what I've learned from these influencers, and it's all about trading your expectations for appreciation. I wish I had that in my instilled in me so much so that I didn't have to worry about belonging or being popular or being this or that. Because nowadays, now that we're in the social media craze and we're crazy and people are saying, please follow me, please follow me. But what are you doing? What are you talking about? I was actually watching um, an episode because I usually don't have the time, but then I actually watched um, Gary B. That's his name. Sorry, <laughs> Gary B. And there was this one guy that came on and said to follow me. And I just love what Gary B. had to say to him, say, you know, yeah, we can follow you, but remember, don't be selfless. You know, make sure that you are putting the work that's for the people and not worried about getting follows and follows. And I was just like, bam, you see, this is what I needed when I was 20. So I want to tell me that, you know what, trade your expectations for appreciation, love yourself, gratitude, be be more, more aware of yourself. I wish someone would have told me that. I wish I had Daniel Goldman next to me with the emotional intelligence part. Because that really made me, that really showed me about self-awareness because people that are meeting me and show me, they're like, Sandy, you're just so like laid back and chill. You don't get upset if someone said this to you. And I'm like, I'm like, life is too short. If some of them know my story, they would see why I'm not even struggling. Even dealing with narcissistic people. I just be like, I have nothing to say to them. They, they always going to be the same, but my advice would be, I'm so, I always go far. <laughs> I'm like, um, my advice for them is to um, really take a good look at themselves and be, be in love with yourself. It's, it's not, you're not being selfish. It's about knowing what you truly are so that you can show the better version of yourself than the fakeness. Yeah. Yeah. I think that like, self-love and self-appreciation is so important because I mean I think you're kind of living proof of this like we we are the only person that we're going to be stuck with our entire lives right we have people that may come and go for whatever reason but we're stuck with ourselves no matter what so you might as well learn to love yourself you, yeah I, I just learned to just accept who I am without my family members anymore I mean even with the family members I thought I could connect with, I decided that I'm just going to make new friends who are going to be my family because now I get to choose who gets to be in my circle. Yeah. You know, I don't have to go and beg, oh, be my friend because I'm alone. No, it doesn't work that way. So true. So Sandy, if people want to connect with you online, follow up about any of your webinars or speaking or anything like that, where can they find you? Um, my name, Sandy Ruku, <laughs> com. I love to put in the name and I actually have a speaking page and everything. Um, I have a blog and it's a weekly blog that I post out and everything. And I am on Facebook, I'm on Instagram, if you want to still talk to me, um, Twitter and LinkedIn, where you can get all the valuable input about social isolation, loneliness, because this is something that is near, dear to me to help you guys to really have the real human connections that are meaningful, open, honest, and emotionally vulnerable, because we don't want to be left, left behind in that wilderness. And, but some days you may have to be in solitude just to find yourself though. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sandy. <laughs> Thank you guys. Have a good one. Make sure you check, check out Mallory. <laughs>